good news is I'll just take a couple of minutes. But uh, delighted to be here representing the Waterfront Alliance and Dewberry for this important panel. You know, I've worked with all four of these fine uh, individuals one time or another, so I told them to be careful what they say because I, I know all their secrets. But um, th this is an uh, incredibly important topic. I'd like to talk about uh, the f four real uh, topics, subjects that the Waterfront Alliance is particularly concerned about in uh, what I like to call good water, bad water. Good water, bad water. Um, the first is, of course, resilience. Uh, if you've got a surge wave headed your way, that, that's kind of a bad water situation. Um, uh, so resilience, obviously, we're spending the whole day focused on that topic. Uh, the second one is really the paradigm shift in the energy uh, uh, world that we're talking about now where we're, where we're starting to put um, wind farms out there in the water uh, and the dramatic impact that might have in so many ways. I think that's an important topic. Uh, a third, third is water quality. Uh, the Waterfront Alliance keeps our eyes and studies water quality. And uh, obviously we're very interested in proving uh, the water quality. Uh, we're very interested in figuring out how to reduce CSOs. Uh, along with um, the toxics related to really the industrial revolution that are sitting in, in some cases uh, in our harbor and the waterways leading into our harbor that some, are which some of which are Superfund sites being cleaned up now. So water quality is sort of issue number three. And then we have issue number four, which is really navigation and waterborne commerce and making sure we, uh, we, we sustain that in the New York, New Jersey Harbor way. Um, you know, as we've seen, as if, you, if you're in this business and if you're th in the room, you know something about it. Um, these ships keep getting bigger. Uh, and uh, bigger ships need more draft. And uh, more draft doesn't just uh, create itself. Uh, sometimes we have to get involved in creating it uh, through deepening projects. And uh, the Corps of Engineers has led uh, harbor deepening projects in New York, New Jersey for, for many years with a lot of partners. And uh, that's what we're focused on today. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs that depend on port commerce. Um, it's a critical engine in our, uh, in, our, in our economy here locally, including the very important working waterfront community, which the Alliance absolutely strongly supports. Um, so we're here to talk about the harbor deepening. W we're also here to talk about when you do the deepening, you create all this material. And, uh, and we have to do something with that material. And over the decades, our approach to that material has changed uh, and improved. And uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of ways to beneficially use that material, I think, in this um, panel that I think you'll find creative. And I know it's an important to the core and many of us in here that that gets done. Um, so really happy to turn the panel over to a very capable individual and also one of our uh, board members, uh, Pippa Brashear. Pippa? Um, hello. Um, I'm Pippa Brashear. I'm a um, member of the board of the Waterfront Alliance. Um, I'm also a landscape architect and planner. And you may ask, why on earth is a designer um, facilitating a panel on harbor deepening and dredge? Um, and, you know, I work on climate adaptation and ecological design, but this topic here is about synergies, mutual benefits, and complementary opportunities. And that is so key um, to unlocking and enabling the economic opportunities that our ports provide, as well as the um, environmental benefits and adaptation needs that we need to find through things like nature-based infrastructure. So. Often, 
Um, you know, I've been a, a part of the Waterfronts Alliance community for a long time, and one of the things that I think is so great is, is, is a convener, right? It's one of the few places that I've come and always been where the maritime industry, all of us who work and care about the water are here together trying to solve problems. The maritime industry, um, folks doing wetland restoration, right? And I think so often the conversation on how we value and use our waterways is one of conflicting uses and trade-offs, you know, and how that, that really put or pit industry and the economy um, against particular maritime industry, um, against restoration and conservation of aquatic habitats. And I think where we find ourselves today is in, you know, what might seem like a novel situation, but I hope you will realize after today's panel um, talks a little more that it's not that new, um, is, at least for New York, um, is that the act and operating of dredging, which we need to do, as John alluded to, to sustain the, the viability of our, um, of our port, our fundamental part of our economy, um, you know, can produce the very product that we need, sediment and substrate, to save marshes from drowning, to build beaches, even lift infrastructure um, and parks. So, you know, the question that we're here to explore today, and, and my panelists who know much more about this than me, um, are gonna help share their insight with you, is can we successfully beneficially reuse dredge material from the next harbor deepening project, um, you know, to construct natural and nature-based infrastructure, to support restoration and, and adaptation more broadly, right? Um, this is not new. The Army Corps and the folks you'll hear from today are doing this in districts across the country. They're there, we did it before with the last harbor deepening. Um, your things are happening in New Jersey through the Philadelphia district, um, the Great Lakes district. Um, there are different models and examples for how this can be done um, and what you're going to hear about from folks here today. Um, you know, this is also a topic and practice that spans disciplines, and I think, like, I see a lot of diverse faces here, right? All of us can lend creativity and ideas to this, right? It's not new in my own discipline of landscape architecture. Uh, shameless pitch, my uh, colleague at SCAPE, Gina Worth, is a member of the Dredge Research Collaborative. They just published a book called Silt, Sland, and Slurry, right? We're all thinking about sediment dredge is a resource and not just a, a product. Um, but how do we connect the dots and turn ideas into action right here in New York Harbor? Can beneficial reuse happen at scale? Um, how and what should we be using it for? Um, the large, and particularly the large volume that's gonna come from the next harbor deepening. Um, and and what, what can we do with that? So, um, these are some of the questions for today, and I hope that you learn a lot, but I also hope that this is really the beginning of a conversation from the folks of us you see up here, but from all of you. So I'm going to give a brief introduction um, to my panelists. I'm joined with, but joined by Paul uh, Tuminello, the Chief of Civil Works and Project Management Branch, um, responsible for New York District Civil Works Program at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about the dredging operations on the next, um, the next harbor deepening. Um, Andrea Rosenthal, who's the Bryce, uh, Vice President at AECOM. Um, and manages multidisciplinary environmental teams. She's an expert and specialist in environmental um, permitting. And if any of you have been involved in this work, that you know the key to getting it done is figuring that out. So we want to focus on getting things done. Um, and Robert Acker at um, Arup, who has many years of experience in coastal engineering and numerical modeling, um, and really figuring out from the technical side, how do we do this? How do we get it done? How do we engineer these opportunities and solutions? So I want to um, I want to turn it over first um, to Paul. And Paul, can you kind of paint the picture and tell us a little bit about um, the upcoming harbor deepening? What harbor deepening is? You know, what what is dredge and what is the the benefit that it's it, it can bring in this context? that before I start my presentation? No, uh, that, that is I, that's your presentation. Okay, today. great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what he's presenting about, so we act like we just right. happen <coughs> to have this slide deck so here. So th thank you, Pippa, and uh, I want to thank the Waterfront Alliance for the opportunity to be here today, uh, to basically talk with all of you about dredging and dredge material. Um, it's, a, it's a really fascinating topic. We could probably spend uh, days, months uh, talking about this. Um, before I, I uh, go through my presentation, though, I want to acknowledge that it is a huge partnership effort. Uh, the Corps of Engineers and the Port Authority often sign up as formal partners, 
but we have a lot of other agencies and stakeholders who get involved in the work we do. And as a team, we, we do this successfully. Without everybody's participation, we, we wouldn't be able to do this. So, so why do we dredge? It, it really boils down to one word, economics. It is extremely efficient to move large quantities of cargo <coughs> in big ships that draw deep draft or deep water. And we need to dredge in order for those ships to get into berths, to discharge cargo, or to take on cargo. And the New York, New Jersey Harbor is one of the world's greatest natural harbors. Uh, the Corps actually got involved in work in New York Harbor back in the mid-1800s uh, with our first navigation project uh, on the East River at Hell's Gate. And then over the years, Congress, uh, through various uh, authorizations, expanded our role. And today, the New York District is responsible for some 240 miles of navigation channel in and around the New York, New Jersey area, up the Hudson River, and along some of the, the coastal waterways of Long Island and northern New Jersey. We're, we're really going to focus a lot, though, today about, about a 30 to 35 miles of what we call the really deep draft navigation channels that we actually finished deepening to 50 feet a few years ago. And, and we do this again because of economics. Uh, the Port of New York is the, and New Jersey is the largest on the East Coast, uh, second largest in the country, although occasionally, as cargo volumes shift a little bit, it, it vies for first place. Uh, but it has a huge reach all the way across the eastern third of the country, up into Canada, and, and essentially uh, goods coming in from all around the world and sending goods out to all over the world. Uh, so I like to think of basically three broad categories of dredging. Uh, when we do new work, basically pulling up virgin materials, material on, on the harbor floor that's never been dredged previously. Uh, there's maintenance dredging, which uh, occurs on basically a, a recurring basis, uh, mainly to maintain the existing channels for safe navigation. And there you're pulling out mainly the sands and the silts, things like that that will settle out into those channels uh, because of the movement of currents throughout the harbor. And then the third category uh, I'd like to talk about is environmental dredging. Uh, comments were made about a lot of the industrial uses of this area over the years. A lot of contamination has ended up in the harbor, and so we do dredge to, to basically improve the environment. And, and the geology is pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, I know the geologists in our office get pretty excited when we, we get involved in the, the technical parts of, of the work we do. Um, and you, we find a variety of material throughout the harbor. Uh, and just to emphasize, when we do maintenance dredging, it's typically the silts and the sands, that finer material that, that settles out uh, periodically and has to be dredged out. Uh, when we do the new deepening, if you will, into that virgin material, we encounter uh, a bigger variety of materials, uh, harder materials, glacial tills, sands, clays, and then bedrock. And there's even a mixture of bedrock uh, in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. And because of that variety of material, we use a variety of tools. Uh, and I just depict here you know, five dredges that we have used in the harbor typically for our work. And, and you can see the types of material that those dredges will uh, pull up when they, when they do their work. Uh, the center top pitcher, the drill belt, is probably the most, most exciting for me when we've had to blast uh, bedrock, where we actually drill and plant charges and then blast to, to break up the rock. And then it can be removed with one of the other pieces of equipment. Now, that generates a lot of material, and there are a variety of, of uh, ways we can use that material. Some of my fellow panelists are going to talk about that, and, and I'm also going to touch on it a little bit here. Uh, again, because of the mix, some of it has uh, a demand. Sand is something that we, we all like having pulled out of the harbor because uh, it can be used for beach nourishment, aggregate, things like that. Uh, some of the materials, again, are contaminated. Uh, they end up being... Uh, handled in a special way. They go uh, in, in an area where they can be capped, let's say, in a landfill. And rock, of course, has a variety of uses. So to give you a sense of, of quantities here, um, this is a, a slide from when we were working on the 50-foot deepening. Uh, over about a 10-year period uh, during the, the bulk of that dredging work, uh, we were projecting about 66 million cubic yards of material. Uh, 42 million cubic yards of that was going to be new material for the 50-foot deepening. And then the other 20-some million was basically 
material that is coming out through, through routine maintenance. Uh, and you can see on the chart there uh, the variety and, and the approximate quantities. And, and to give you a sense of how much we're talking about, if you were to place 66 million cubic yards of material on Central Park, you would basically have a block that was about 48 feet high. So it's, it's a lot of material. And again, there are a number of ways uh, that that material can be used. Uh, oops. There we go. Uh, the core, and I know the Port Authority is our partner, are very proud of uh, the way we did, uh, utilized a lot of the dredge material that came out of the 50-foot deepening. Uh, the core has a, a goal today of reusing beneficially at least 70% uh, of the material that comes out of the harbor. Uh, for the 50-foot, we are actually able to use nearly 100%. And the slide here that keeps flashing up and down uh, shows you a number of the, the, the uh, ways that we use material, whether it was uh, for landfills, uh, beach nourishment, um, rock on the reefs, or across the bottom, you see we, we used a lot of material to construct um, marsh islands in Jamaica Bay, which uh, was something we're, we're quite proud of. And in fact, in parallel to the work we did uh, to the harbor deepening, we did a study called the Hudson River and Estuary uh, Restoration. Uh, uh, the Port Authority was our sponsor, along with a number of uh, other uh, state and uh, local agencies. Um, and we basically developed a report recommending to Congress 20 sites for construction. And c Congress actually authorized those in the Water Resource Development Act of 2020. And, and I'm glad to say through appropriations and the infrastructure bill, we have received design and construction money. And now a number of those sites are moving forward. And they will use uh, dredge material uh, specifically on things like New Marsh Islands in Jamaica Bay to build, if you will, the foundations. Now, the amount of material, 66 million yards, uh, and we're actually looking at uh, about half that quantity for when we go from 50 to 55 feet, needs a, needs a plan for management. Now, we did that for the 50-foot deepening with a dredge material management plan. And that was revised periodically to meet the, the current needs of, of uh, the volumes of material that were being generated. The last one was actually issued in 2008. Uh, but as we move into the next phase of deepening, going from 50 to 55 feet, and we couple that with the, the routine maintenance, uh, we're going to need a new dredge material management plan. Uh, we expect to generate between 6 and 7 million cubic yards just from our, our recurring maintenance. Uh, on the 50 to 55 foot, we're looking at about 33 million cubic yards of material to be generated. We want to find someplace beneficial for all of that, and the dredge material management plan is going to help us do that. Uh, you're going to hear more about that um, and what Congress is helping us with uh, in the Water Resource Development Act is they've given us the authority to consider the benefits of beneficial reuse versus just the least cost disposal option. That was often uh, the way we were uh, handling the material in the past. So we're, we're really excited about that uh, for some of our future work. And you may have already started to hear about the rollout of the new dredge material management plan. There's recently been a couple of sessions, and there's more to come uh, that will talk about uh, ways that uh, material that we're going to be dredging can be utilized. I'd like to sum it up, really, in this slide, which is probably one of the New York District's favorite slides. Um, we've, we've talked about how important navigation is to the region and the country. Uh, the environment, we want to be good custodians, and we want to protect, and now we're even doing uh, uh, projects to restore the environment. And then we talk about safety and security, which is really more about resilience, especially post-Hurricane Sandy, and, and as we begin to recognize the uh, impacts of climate change, we want to re reduce the risk in this city, provide more resilience, and I think dredge material plays a role in all three of these rings. And uh, I look forward to hearing from the rest of my fellow panelists, as well as uh, the rest of you here today with any questions that you, uh, you have or, or thoughts you want to offer. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, you know, what's so key is it, 
you know, the ring slide is a great place to end because it really, dredge is a part of all of these and dredge materials management. Um, and so Paul gave us a good picture of sort of what is the, what is coming out from the dredging and the scale and why we need it, as well as how it might be used. So why don't we just go do it? Um, you know, Andrea, I think you and you bring a lot of experience from sort of taking the dredge material from the, you know, coming out of the channel to getting it beneficially reused. And could you talk a little bit about, you know, what do we need to, what are the considerations? What are the challenges um, in doing that? And, and what are some examples for how other um, regions or locations have, have overcome the challenges in beneficially reusing dredge? Thank you, Pippa, and good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to provide an overview of what makes the placement options suitable and feasible and to discuss a very interesting example of a placement facility and a processing facility in Virginia called Weenek Labs. Placement options for dredge material need to be both technically, and technically suitable and feasible from many perspectives, including economics. And there are several factors that can determine whether a particular placement option is first suitable. These include whether the placement site has a geographic restriction on the origin of the material, the contaminant level requirements of the facility, and the geographic, I'm sorry, and the um, water content and, uh, and geologic characteristics of the material. There are also many factors that can affect whether a placement option is feasible, including cost, which is also a very important consideration. And these include the timing of when, a placement, of when the placement is needed, the volume of dredge material versus the available capacity of the, of the particular option, the distance to the placement site and the water depth that's available there, as well as things like tipping fees, handling fees, and placement fees. Does the material require dewatering or amending? And if so, can that be done at the dredge site? At, can it be done at the placement location? Or is there a regional processing facility that's available? Um, also, does the, the, do the uh, placement facilities have sufficient depth um, you know, for, for offloading and containing the material? Do they have docks? You know, what, what are the, what's the infrastructure that's there? Do you have to build berms? You know, what, what, what types of infrastructure is available? And how many times the, will the material need to be handled? The more times material needs to be handled, the more expensive the option is. Weenek land is an absolutely fabulous example of a versatile dredge material placement and processing facility <laughs> located on 280 acres along the James River in Shaw City, Virginia, and originally part of the Shirley Estate. Weenek land was founded in 1994, so for 30 years, this facility has been operating. The land was formerly a gravel mine and sand gravel uh, mining facility. And it, very interestingly, it's the site of two dredge material placement facilities, Weenek Land Reclamation and Port Tobacco. Weenek Land Reclamation also serves as a dredge material processing facility, which means that the material is not ultimately placed there, but it's watered and amended and then goes off-site. There are also uh, two separate uh, permit requirements for each of these facilities. At Weenek Land uh, Reclamation, the dredge material is used to restore sand and gravel pits, and it also is used for agricultural field applications where it meets VDEQ clean requirements. A very important factor for this facility, I think, which has enabled it to last as long as it has, is that it has no geographic restrictions on the origin of the material. So material can be brought from any location and either placed there or processed there. 
It also has a very wide range of contaminant levels that it accepts, which is another reason that it's, it's been able to keep functioning. Uh, but it does not accept hazardous material. However, hazardous material can be processed there. So there are instances where hazardous material is brought there, it's rewarded and amended, and then it's placed off-site. Um, material that has gone there has included material from Maryland as well as New Jersey. So New Jersey material has gone there. Um, at Weenock Land Port Tobacco, the material is used to restore tidal wetlands and um, at Shirley Cove. And this facility only accepts material from Virginia. Another interesting fact is that there's a certain ge geographic range of where material can come from where they don't even have to test it before it's, before it's placed. And material in Virginia that goes there from outside that, that area does have to meet uh, various uh, clean fill requirements. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Pippa and then to Robert. I think, you know, Andrea highlights the importance of having a facility and a place and all the steps that it takes to go from what you get out of the, the harbor or dredging um, to where you place it. Um, but Robert, I think you have experience with sort of the realization of some of these projects and what it takes to, you know, what you do with it, how you place it, and what can happen once it's there. Can you maybe share um, your example and give us some inspiration there? Yeah, of course. I'd be happy to. So over my career, I've worked on a number of different uh, projects where we've ranged from small-scale um, thin layer placement of material to nourish existing wetlands and try to assist with sea level rise concerns and, and die-offs to incredibly large-scale projects. And this is a large-scale project I'm going to discuss today. Uh, this is Cheers, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. It's on the Great Lakes rather than an oceanfront property. So it's, it's a much different ecosystem than we're used to dealing with here in New York and New Jersey. But we have a lot of lessons we can learn from this project and a lot of ideas. This is, on the screen you can see here, a conceptualization of the project. And we'll see if I can make this work. Nope, OK. Um, <laughs> in the, the lower center is the artist rendition, rendering of what the Cheers Park will look like after construction. The current shoreline pretty much follows the major highway there, which is an interstate. And then the community behind that is a economically disadvantaged community in Cleveland and has been for uh, several decades. So the goal of the project is, uh, is very broad ranging and robust. So here's a, you know, the, the breakup of the different options the 55th Street Marina there on the left and the Inner City Yacht Club both currently exist. All of the green space between them and extending out into the water is new and proposed for this project. Um, so the idea is to take beneficial use material that's being dredged within the Great Lakes region, which is a significant quantity, find a home for it, and that home becoming a new um, community space, a new activity space, a new um, access point for an economically disadvantaged community that has been underserved for generations. Um, you know, this, this is being looked at through the Port of Cleveland, which again is, is a unique opportunity here. The port does a lot of dredging. They need the dredging to maintain their vessels and the economics like you know, Paul brought up a little bit ago, but at the same time, you know, they have to pay to have that material disposed of. They send it to a confined disposal facility, or CDF, and that material builds up and then gets capped. Eventually, these CDFs fill and can accept no more material. And a lot of the CDFs within the Great Lakes regions are nearing capacity. So the idea here is that, um, you know, the Port of Cleveland is doing all this various maintenance within the, the river and the lake and what needs to be maintained and managed with the help of the Army Corps, you know, that material has to go somewhere. And the CDFs are starting to reach capacity. Um, deep water disposal is no longer allowed. So what can we do proactively to create a disposal area for this, facility, for this material that's being generated on yearly maintenance projects while still benefiting 
the larger community and looking forward to all of the various um, drivers that the port and the city and the uh, core are all looking at. How can we shift the focus from just what is a utilitarian um, immediate need to what is a long-term plan that benefits the social and economic area as well? Um, so talking about you know numbers, these are obviously much smaller. It's, it's a smaller area, but 270,000 cubic yards of material each year by the Army Corps. Um, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, currently it goes to CDFs, which you can see one on the left. Open lake placement is no longer allowed, as people know that that, that doesn't really help anybody. It just exacerbates all the various problems. Um, so here's that image. You can see what the existing shoreline looks like now. And then this is, I just want to acknowledge, you know, a project of this scope, you know, the, the, the yardage we're talking about is not enough to like build this park in the course of a few years. This project is going to span almost 20 years. I mean, I can literally be working on this project the rest of my career. <laughs> it's, it's not going to, it's not going to be built overnight. It's not going to be built anytime quickly. It's not something that necessarily parents are going to be able to take their kids to. It's their kids are going to take their kids to this project when it's completed. So there's a lot of people involved in making this happen. And that goes back to the, the comments we were talking about at the opening plenary. And you know it, it takes a village to get these projects done. It's not just an engineering team. It's not just the port. It's not just the outreach community. It really does take a lot of people. And you know here's the list of ac actions and problems that they face. You know, I mean, the, these are pictures of the site as it is right now. You know, there's critical infrastructure right on the edge there. The ice action, which again, it's not something we see currently in the New York, New Jersey region unless we start going upriver on the Hudson. But, you know, the, these are all impacts that are getting worse and worse with climate change uh, or the economic disadvantage of the area. So, you know, we've done various economic and social outreach analyses, kind of like was discussed with the um, the podcast presenter and uh, earlier. The idea is that we want to look at all the different aspects, the economic and social justice, the, um, the economic impact of the dredge material and where this is going, how what it's going to cost to dispose of. Um, so, you know, and then part of that benefit cost analysis is how does this impact the local property values? You know, we heard about that with the, the property taxes going up and how that's more difficult for, you know, our, our lovely neighbors in New Jersey. Um, but here in this instance, it's a way to, you know, that this community is, is very much undervalued at the moment. So this would help bring their values more in line with what they should be given that their, their area used to be uh, quite lovely. So I want to finish with, you know, and again, it, this is all renderings and things. Of the project is in early planning phases. You know, placements will change, shorelines will change as the engineering continues. But we are looking to realize a new and better future for this lakefront and turn it into an area that, you know, is, is genuinely a pleasure to go visit. So, and I think that's the forward-thinking, beneficial use that we all are trying to see and realize going from the nuts and bolts of here's the types of material, here's how the material is being extracted, why it's being extracted, and uh, aspects like this to here's how we can use these various materials and aspects and the, the benefits we can give to the local communities. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I'm going to kind of – sorry, I'm having trouble with leaning over um, – to start kind of this more in a conversation, um, Paul, you talked about sort of how some of the last harbor deepening was beneficially reused, you know, what's already on the books for the Army Corps in terms of some of the projects identified through the Hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan. Robert, you really showed, you know, how you might enable uh, a large-scale lakefront vision. I want to ask each of you, what do you think is the most or maybe the top two most promising beneficial reuse opportunities 
um, as you look towards the next harbor deepening. You know, the type, the type of beneficial reuse and maybe where. Um, and this can span, as, as, as Bob, you alluded to, you know, what maybe is something we can do in the near term versus that long-term vision. Sure. I, I mean, for the core, I think as we, we look ahead uh, at the 55-foot deepening and also the routine maintenance, um, again, coupling it with the restoration uh, projects that we've been given authority to do, um, I, I think for us that's, you know, keeping the material, if you will, in the New York, New Jersey Harbor estuary area and uh, creating those platforms for wetlands and, and things like that. Although I suspect our dredge material management plan uh, is going to identify a lot of other beneficial uses uh, that may become just as attractive as, as the work we've seen in the past. Andrea? Yeah, um, I think it depends on the contaminant level and the geotechnical criteria of the material. So as Paul mentioned, you know, you're going to have rock and clean sand and there should be a lot of, um, a lot more wider ways that the material can be uh, beneficially reused. I think the issue is going to be any soft, silty material that holds a lot of water and has high level contaminants and whether um, through amending the material, whether there's facilities there that either allow it to be amended um, at the placement site or, or a regional facility or something like that, then I could see that uh, the material could be uh, beneficially used um, to, you know, for, for many, many things like brownfields and, and, uh, and other types of uses. Bob? Yeah, I'd like to see, um, you, you know, the, of course, sand being clean sand is going to be in the most demand because it's the most attractive uh, material. But one of the things that we noticed with uh, the various storms in this region, with Sandy and with um, Ida, Irene, all these various, uh, you know, the, the width of the gentle sloping beaches really does mitigate a lot of the damage that you get from surge action, from wave action. So we have I know there are plans for expanding the various beaches. I'd like to see some of this dredge material start creating a, I, I think the phrase is a sand loop, where we dredge it out from these channels and start placing it in uh, discrete nourishment packets along the mm -hmm. waterfront so that we can create these wider buffer regions. So that, you know, going back to preemptively looking at what are our risk areas, what are our risk categories, how can we build you know, the marshes are great. That's going to create good dissipation system. It's going to create good habitat. But we also need to look at, you know, the, the improvement to these buffer zones that we can create from this material. Sure. I, I, if I could just add, I would agree. And um, the core does that in a number of locations, especially on inlets on Long Island, uh, where we place sand uh, on the beach, adjacent beaches, uh, yep. kind of that renourishment cycle, and, and that builds that resiliency. Yeah. Yeah, and I know the Corps does a lot of that in Florida and in California, and I know there's some here in New York, New Jersey. I just feel like there could be more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to that point, um, you know, these are the opportunities. Um, what are the barriers to, to making that happen, to getting the sand from the chal channel to the, um, you know, to the beach or the wetland that you think are particular to New York City, and, and what are, how, what are your initial ideas for how to overcome them with a particular eye to the partnerships we might need to create, right? Um, you know, both within but also beyond um, the, the Army Corps. Interested in your thoughts. You go first, Andrea? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the that's expert a, on the biggest that's a barrier. That's big question. <laughs> okay, I think there's, there's many aspects to this. I think, I think one, you know, one of them is cost, right? Cost, you know, being cost feasible um, which I talked about all the factors that go into that. So one is definitely the economics of, of a particular option. Then there's the whole regulatory permitting, environmental impact assessment, testing process that goes into that as well. So, you know, I think, um, <coughs> you know, looking at, at, at those, you know, uh, types of uh, variables, and I think one, one idea might be to you know, the core will have a good idea of, of what the volume is going to be of each of these various classes of material. And then, you know, even if you have like a, an, an idea as opposed to actual testing, you can, we could then begin to identify locations or, or options where we could potentially beneficially use each of these classes of material 
and then screen them for whether they have the various infrastructure, depth, um, all those things that go into it so that by the time the um, actual dredging occurs, there would be a solid plan of about how the material, uh, sorry, about how the material could be used. Yeah, and I, I think that um, I saw a presentation at the National Conference on Ecosystem Restoration, some folks from ERDIC, the I'm going to forget the acronym of what ERDIC stands, but the research arm of the research. core, Engin Engineering Research Development Center, yes. um, you know, have started to develop screening tools that some of the districts are using to, to do that kind of thing. Yeah, I, th I think because it's, you know, we're talking about a small area, right, and in a way, you know, we're talking about New York Harbor. So I would think you know, based on development that's going to take place, based on the roads and all the things that go on in New York Harbor, we would be able to do that. That's my, you know, guess that mm -hmm. we would. Yeah. Paul, your thoughts? Uh, no, it's, uh, I mean, Andrea mentions cost, I think timing. Uh, you know, we face that right now uh, within my program. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to, we're in the middle of plans and specs for deepening uh, the graves and anchorages. Uh, we expect to start construction on that in late 2025. Uh, and I have another project, uh, Marsh Islands, which is in plans and specs in Jamaica Bay. Uh, will the material be suitable is going to be the first thing as, we, as we, we move forward on testing. And then timing. When we're ready to dredge, is that project going to be ready to receive it? Um, that, that becomes the big challenge. It's, and I hope, at least for the, the, the bigger, longer term, the dredge material management plan, is going to help us manage that and mm -hmm. the timing. Uh, and again, I think all the agencies and stakeholders, your input is, is extremely important to the, the work we're going to be doing. Yeah. Bob, anything to add before we open it up for? <laughs> yeah, I'll be a little bit of a, a rebel here and say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you both have mentioned cost as the barrier. I, I do think that the timing is the bigger barrier because yeah. well, whether we money. use the cost um, or whether we use the material beneficially or not, there is still an enormous cost attached to it wherever it goes. So I think that uh, as a design engineer, as a designer working with you know HIPAA and, and, and designing, I, I think the biggest barrier isn't the cost of these projects, it's having the projects through permitting, through the regulatory approvals, well. just waiting for the material to be made available. It's, you, you know, make a great point, Paul. We know the material's coming, mm -hmm. so why aren't people looking at yeah. what we can do with that material when it's dug out in two, three years' <coughs> time? Because people start looking at, oh, well, where are they digging this year? It's like, we need to start looking a few years in the future so we can get the permitting process underway, we can get the design process underway, we can have a number of projects that are at the 90-ish percent ready to pull off a shelf and go, okay, the management plan says I get X amount of Y material, which of these projects is ready to go, and then initiate that project at the time. Yeah. All right, I think that's a good uh, that's a good point to, to <laughs> leave us on and see if <laughs> others have questions, because I'm sure you all have questions and comments for our panelists. I can take that as a start. Sure. I mean, the Port Authority is our, our cost sharing partner uh, for the next deepening, the 50 to 55 foot. Uh, and so certainly we'll be talking with them uh, about the potential uses uh, in the context of, of the master plan that they've, they've looked, you know, rolled out. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges to using the material for, you know, port infrastructure improvement is the type of material that's mm -hmm. available at the time because the material, you know, generally has to be, uh, has to be able to have enough bearing capacity mm -hmm. to support the design. So that is one of the, the challenges. I think around 8 million cubic yards or whatever are anticipated to be that silty, fine material that has to be dewatered and amended. 
So I think that's one of the challenges of using it for um, point of destruction improvement and also contaminant levels. Yeah, it's, um, I, I feel like the, the, the port will, will take whatever material they can, but a lot of the reason that we use this material for parks, for wetlands restoration, everything goes back to the, the bearing capacity of the soils. These are, uh, the term is dredge slurry. A lot of it comes up as a, a liquid muck and it's gotta be dewatered, but in the end, you still have a, a very water retentive muck that you're trying to build on. And you're either gonna need to do deep foundations for the industrial aspects or something like that, where if you bring in rock or you use something like that, you have that bearing capacity already, your foundation costs go down. So it's a give and take. Um, but I think, Paul, there, is that I mean we don't know exactly what's going to come out, but there will be more larger material, some rock from the harbor deepening versus sort of that um, portion of the more maintenance dredging. Correct. Yeah, th that's correct. We expect uh, again we go into if you will the virgin material, the newer materials, uh, hopefully less contaminants than we've encountered in the past because a lot of that's already been pulled out of the, the channels, um, and there will be a lot of rock in there and you know the harder materials, and that may give us more uh, options in terms of uses. Other questions? John. Uh, I didn't think you were allowed to ask questions, John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can ask questions. Um, <laughs> Bob, I was going to ask you a question, but first I'm going to ask Paul a question. And um, it has to do with, uh, Paul, what's, what's the government estimate in terms of the cost of the, uh, the, the 50 to 55 foot? Give us the best number of what government thinks it's going to cost to to bring that off and then my my second question would be how much of that cost is associated with managing the material after it's been removed from where it sits right now uh, no good question um, so the feasibility study uh, that Congress authorized for construction identifies a, a 6.3 billion dollar uh, number for the, the 50 to 55 foot deep, either the main navigation channels. Um, I don't know the answer to the second part, but I can always look that up and get it from our, our technical folks in, on exactly the portion that's the management part of that in terms of material. Thanks, I'm just gonna, I have the mic. So, so Bob, I'm good to see you. And, and I wanted to talk about Cheers because that's an amazing project. Congratulations to your firm for leading it. Um, would seem to me that that project has a significant mitigation challenge because uh, you're building a park on a waterfront. You're going to be, um, it looks like you're going to be uh, uh, building on top of what is now aquatic habitat. And uh, I'd like to know a little bit about how uh, the team is going to deal with that significant challenge. Um, I'm going to sound a little cheeky as I start this answer. <laughs> the the best part of how we're dealing with that is we're not doing it in New York State. Uh, <laughs> 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 Telling answer. Uh, different states and different regions have different criterias for regulation and different criterias for mitigation and things like that. Uh, New York State, I'm not going to say is the most difficult, but it's in the top four. <laughs> so, uh, by, by contrast, the regulations for uh, lakefront habitat in Ohio are significantly less. So there, there, are, there are ways and rules and laws even that allow for the creation of this type of habitat because it is a park site, because it is helping with the economic social justice of the, the city, it is development. You know, like if this was a giant uh, mercury refining plant, it would not be moving forward. But because it is Cheers, it opens doors that allows for this. It's, it's a combination of the site's gonna be, to a certain extent, uh, a CDF, a confined disposal facility, which have to exist on the waterfront. There, there's, I mean, you can put them upland, but then you get into the Army Corps' benefit cost, and it winds up costing between 15 and 35 times as much trucking that material upland as it does putting it on the waterfront. So it's already established that the CDFs have to be on the waterfront in the Great Lakes. 
and then from that we then further expand okay if it is a cdf do we just want another you know ugly box that we're filling and then capping with concrete or do we want to do something proactive for the community with this new cdf facility so it's looking at how do we do something we've been doing for a long time and tweak it just a little bit to improve the entire system from start to finish so we're starting with we need a new cdf well, what can we do to make that more than just a CDF? And then where do we target the location of the CDF so that it benefits the most people at, you know, who are currently receiving less of these benefits than normal? So yeah, I had to start with the, the riff. I mean, I love New York State, but <laughs> you are right. Trying to do this in New York State would not work with the way that, and this goes to your question, Pippa, what kind of arrangements and negotiations and discussions do we need? I think there needs to be um, a much deeper discussion between the regulatory agencies uh, about how do we get the permitting for beneficial use uh, ex slightly accelerated. I mean, I don't want to accelerate it to the point where people can't make comments. There are groups like Riverkeeper who make great comments and do good work helping police our waterfronts. But we do need to drop the permitting time from years to year so that we have the projects ready when the material is ready. <laughs> Robert, I'd just like to add to what you said. Um, this is Course. something that I, you know, I've been involved with for a long time. And you know, um, I think it really, it goes back to a couple of things. Like, I think one is how the material, excuse me, how the material is regulated, whether it's considered <coughs> a resource or a waste. And in New York, you know, it's regulated under the solid waste program. Or as, for example, in New Jersey, it's regulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, if you look at states like Maryland, um, you know, they've used dredge material. They have several different ways of, of in-water uses of the material, including creating islands, which have parks and wildlife uh, features on them. Um, I was involved with a, um, a panel of people that, including regulators, that worked on a, a innovative and beneficial use guidance manual that it, the whole purpose was to encourage the use of dredge material. So it's it's, it's almost a mindset of how each state views, views um, you know, the use of dredge material. And I think that, you know, there's a, there's a cost and there's a benefit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly, you know, you wouldn't want to put these things in areas that are highly, um, you know, that have a lot of ecological value. But, you know, they, there, is, there are many benefits that, that um, you know, in water solutions can, can provide. And also in terms of like efficiency, let's say um, you, you want to, you know, you're going to be using millions of cubic yards. Um, one of the things that New York doesn't have is a regional dredge material processing facility. And those facilities, like the one that I talked about in, in Virginia, you know, um, one of the things that make them um, economically viable is to have a, a, a consistent um, stream of material. And you know, from deepening maintenance, uh, dredging, and, and everything else, I think that there would be. And then that soft, silty, mucky material could then really be used economically um, in many innovative ways. So that's, that's some of the things I think we should be considering. I wonder if we have anyone from sort of the the ports and operation. Yeah, go ahead. It, not about that. I just had a, another question. You talked a lot about the environmental benefits of what the materials can support once installed in a new location. I'm wondering if you could talk about the mitigation and tools you use when you're dredging to protect the organisms that live in the bottom of the harbors, because I'm just curious, there must be some impact there as well to that habitat. I mean, I think any dredging operation goes through its own envir like environmental review process. So maybe, I mean, Andrea, this is your wheelhouse, but Paul, maybe you could talk. Yeah, so. um, you know, as part of the permitting process, you have to look, and also the environmental impact assessment process, you have to look at um, what practices can be used um, during the construction, you know, to prevent impacts um, on, on the uh, ecological systems where you're working. So um, some of those things, especially the material is silty, um, are things like silt curtains, for instance, um, use of environmental dredge buckets, and then 
monitoring, water quality monitoring. So those are some of the, the common things. Thank you, Nina. No, yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I know when we've had to dredge in areas where we, we knew the material was contaminated, uh, the type of equipment, closed bucket, so you don't resuspend material and spread it around, things like that. Um, and, you know, of course, we go through a whole NEPA process uh, in, in the bigger picture, and then individual uh, actual dredge contracts, let's say, are going to look at uh, the types of material and, and then equipment you're going to use to minimize any impacts uh, to the surrounding environment. Also, um, just quickly to add, um, you know, when, when you are going to dredge, you know, there's a whole series of sampling and analysis activities that have to be undertaken. And one of the things that you do is you look at the contaminant levels that exist in the surrounding area and then the new dredge surface. So um, sometimes if the material that's going to be uncovered is, is, you know, highly contaminated or more contaminated, than, than the surrounding area. Sometimes you place clean sand there on the bottom. So that's one of the way, ways also that sometimes you can, you can um, you know, protect the environment there. I think we have time for one more question before. And I had wanted to ask too, okay. Um, so Carlina Salguero from Portside, New York, a maritime nonprofit in Redux. So I guess if I have only one, eek. Um, all right, Robert, I'm going to pass. So for the Army Corps, I'm, I didn't get the photo, but I think I saw a charter map where you were showing dredging that goes all the way up the uh, Bay Ridge Channel and then stops near the entrance to Erie Basin but doesn't include the buttermilk. If that's correct, I'm sort of curious why the deepening is still going there when deep water ships don't dock on the outside arm of Erie Basin, but they do go in the buttermilk channel to the Reda Container Terminal and the cruise ship terminal. I, I, and I could be mistaken. The, the slide I had up there was sh essentially showing the footprint of the existing federal navigation channels. Not all of those will be deepened as part of the, the 50 to 55 foot. Do we have to ask the PD? Do you know? Do we have to ask the PDH questions? Are people supposed to answer them? I thought they had to answer them online. I don't Sorry. know if they're being asked online or if they're, because I think we can also do it like Follow okay. Up? Okay. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> um, so, do you guys want to? I want to just give everyone like some closing words, and we're here today. I don't want to keep everyone from lunch, but um, I hope we can all find each other and continue this conversation. But, um, Paul, Andrea, Bob, some last thoughts. Uh, sure, no, thank you again for the, the opportunity uh, to be here today and, and talk about uh, the work that the, the Corps does. Um, you know, I, I'm, we're, we're, we're looking ahead here for the 55 foot deepening at a, you know, a multi-year effort. Again, that's going to involve a lot of stakeholders uh, and other agencies. And as I said at the beginning of my presentation, it, it really is a team effort uh, to make it a success for, one, keeping the port, uh, you know, the premier port, if you will, on the East Coast um, from an economic standpoint, but also, uh, maintaining and restoring the estuary and bringing that resilience in. I think, uh, again, there are opportunities for all of those things uh, as part of this, this project <coughs> as we uh, move out. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to thank also the Waterfront Alliance for the opportunity to, to discuss what we've been discussing today. I think what I want to leave you with is that, you know, I think we need to accelerate um, and start early and plan now for potential beneficial uses. So that, as Paul mentioned, and, and I talked about as well, the timing of the type of material versus options yeah. can be looked at right now. That will also help with the regulatory um, approval process as well. Yeah, and I'd like to thank you all for your patience. It's been a very crowded room, which is exciting for us because it means a lot of, there's a lot of interest. And you did laugh at my jokes, which always makes it easier to sit up here. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you all. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, as you know, John started off with, we think this is like just a very critical um, issue and a, and a nexus where these two kind of parts of things that the Waterfront Alliance does and all of us working on the waterways um, do and grapple with really come together. So I hope everyone here is able to be 
continue to be part of this conversation that you've had a bigger window into some of the technical considerations and trade-offs as we forge ahead and that you're all you're thinking and helping us solve these tough problems of timing, <laughs> cost, mm -hmm. contamination, storage. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. I won't keep anyone from lunch. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Just a couple of housekeeping items.